Now, as you watch this service this evening and you hear the message being preached, I want you to be thinking uh, about, so what do we do in the meanwhile as believers in America? What, as Christians, what should our role be? That would be the first thought. So uh, that means what are, what are tangible uh, uh, brick and mortar practices that we can do in order to preserve the United States? And why would we want to do that? Okay, so this is going to be a challenging night in, in one sense. And the second uh, th would be, how then should we pray for our nation? Uh, in other words, what do we pray for? And, and when we do pray, in what way can we ourselves be participants in bringing about the answers to those prayers? So you follow me so far. When you hear his sermon and you see the outline and the descriptions of the rise and fall of empires, and you come to the conclusion, there's, there's a sense in which you're left, so, so what's next? And that's where we have to engage our minds because he gives a clue. Whether he did it intentionally or not, I do not know, but there's a clue in there uh, that informs us of uh, what our responsibility and what our, our practice should be. So uh, see if you can pick up on that. It's at, actually, it's at, it's at the very end. Nathan, as they said in the good old days, let her flicker. What a great honor to be here this afternoon and share with you a great line of speakers. Wow. Aren't you happy that you are here today? It's amazing because we, we really don't coordinate with, with each other the theme of the, of the messages and they always come together so beautifully. And uh, I'm honored to be here this uh, afternoon, I was in DC for a few days, and uh, you know, there are some spots of light in the darkness there. <laughs> you know, I've met some good Christians, uh, even in Congress and Senate, and I know that there are Bible studies that are going on there every week, prayer meetings, and there's some good Christians that are there to counsel to those congressmen and, um, and, and, and women and senators. And um, however, the topic of the message this afternoon may not be to your liking. <laughs> and you know, um, I walk around the world among Christians, and especially here in America, over the last two and a half months I was here, and they're all concerned and to a certain degree angry and disappointed. And, and I'm like, what did you expect the end times to be like? <laughs> I mean, if anything, everything we see that is happening all around the world should encourage us. You know, it reminds me of the two disciples on that Sunday morning that went all the way down to Emmaus. Remember that? They were disciples. They were not just uh, from the Sanhedrin or Pharisees, Sadducees. I mean, they were disciples. They, know, they, they knew Jesus. They heard every word he had to say. They knew what he said regarding what he has to go through. It didn't come as a surprise. And yet they walked all the way from Jerusalem after they heard from the women that came to the tomb that morning that the tomb is empty. And they were walking and talking with one another. And they were what? Sad. They just heard that he's not there, he's alive. And they are sad. And this is more or less what I get to see around me right now. Everybody is so disappointed that their freedoms are being taken from them. Wow. Show me in what book it says that we will maintain our freedoms at the very end. The book of Second Opinions? <laughs> 
what book? Because the last time I heard about the end times, Jesus is the one who promised us tribulations, but he said, be of good cheer. So why is it that we are so concerned and angry and sad and disappointed? And more so, I'm talking to Americans right now, because, I mean, you look at those screens with the title of the message. Hmm. The bringer of bad news. <laughs> no. I'm someone who is describing reality. It's a reality check. This afternoon, I don't want you to be angry or disappointed or sad. Even if the topic of the message is about the decline of an empire. I want you to understand the times and the seasons in which we live and walk out of here way more encouraged than when you walked in. <laughs> Father, we, we ask that your word will go forth and do that which it was sent for and it will never come back void. Father, I ask that through your word you will encourage us and you will comfort us and you will cause us to understand that we need to put our trust in you and hold on to our heavenly citizenship in these last days. We thank you and we bless you in Jesus name. Amen. 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 So the title of the message this afternoon is the decline of an empire. And it's interesting because uh, World empires, as you all know, entered the scene only after the Tower of Babel. We all know that before, we just don't hear about it. It's, it wasn't there. And we know that when men came together, finally, maybe that is the first global attempt to create something close to global government, one world government, if I may, and we know how it all ended. Let us make a name to ourselves, they said. The Tower of Babel was not about glorifying and worshiping God, but it was all about men. The Bible says in Genesis 11, now the whole earth has one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and make and bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. Lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they pr uh, uh, propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there, there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from, from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel. In Hebrew, Babel from the word to confuse. Because, and by the way, Babylon is Babel, also in Hebrew. It is to confuse. Because there was the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So when they couldn't come together from all over the world, and they were scattered all over the world, now they realize that if they consolidate power wherever they are, they will be able eventually to take over the whole world. 
And we know that throughout the scriptures we can see how nations think and how God think. The sovereignty of God always stands right against the counsel of the nations. Psalm 2 is describing that in a great way. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bond in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in der derision. And then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree that the Lord has said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask for me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. And you better kiss the sun, lest he be angry. And you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Wow. We are so stupid. <laughs> we really think that it's all about us. We really think that we can change the world. Look, sin brought about the flood. The flood destroyed the amazing canopy that was over the earth, protecting the earth in a way. There was no need for rain, if you remember. There was no rain until the flood. And so how did earth receive its um, vegetation? Because there was underground uh, rivers and there was evaporation and it hit that canopy and then it came down and it, it was an amazing, amazing uh, process of how earth had its own, its own ecosystem that had been violated because of sin. And that rain and that torrential rain and that flood that covered the whole earth destroy that ecosystem that was there by God and now it's a damaged planet and everything we suffer from is a consequence of sin and we try sinful people to fix the world that we destroyed because of our very sin there's only one way to fix the world is to address the sin issue rather than the destruction of the earth because of sin you understand that God is in control of everything. We know that. The Bible says he makes nations great and destroys them. He enlarges nations and guides them. But God is the judge in Psalm 75. He puts down one and exalts another. So when 46th president walked into the White House, when I guess he knew then that he's the president, for a few minutes. Do <laughs> you think God was taken by a surprise? Do you really think that this is it? God is completely shocked. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. God is looking at the state of a nation. Many times, and I know some of you will say, oh, we did not vote for this, we don't know. Yes, but you know how many people did? Millions. Therefore, in Jeremiah 25, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and against these nations all around, and I will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and a perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of a mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstone, and the light of the lamp. And these whole land 
land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. Then uh, it will come to pass, when seventy years are completed, that I will punish the king of Babylon. So God says, look, the, the children of Israel needed to be punished. I will allow the king of Babylon to come and make that land desolate. But after 70 years, when I'm done, I'm going to punish the king of Babylon for what he did. Wait a minute. What are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> he allows him to destroy them and then he's punishing him for that? Yes. God did not put the hatred in Nebuchadnezzar's heart for Israel. He actually used it. But he had to pay for that hatred and for what he did. Do you understand the point? And he said, <laughs> then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. Even in Ezekiel 14, the word of the Lord came against me saying, Son of man, when a land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off its supply and bread, send famine on it, and cut off man and beast from it. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. If I cause wild beasts to pass through the land, and, the em and they empty it, and make it so desolate that no man may pass through because of the beasts, even though these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, only that would be delivered and the land would be desolate. Or if I bring a sword on that land and say, sword, go through the land, and I cut off man and beast from it, even though these three men were in it as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, but only they themselves would be delivered. And it goes on and on. So we see that God has no partiality. We also see that God is using world empires. They may think that they have it all going on, they accumulate some power, but God eventually is the one who is allowing things to happen. And look, Daniel chapter 2. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what it is in the darkness and light dwells with him. So we understand that world empires have a very significant role in the history and in Bible prophecy. It's very interesting because uh, if you look back in history, especially through the lens of prophets such as Daniel, you, you clearly see a list of empires. I mean, God's word is addressing them in a very special way. He's addressing Egypt and Assyria and Babylon and Persia and Greece and Rome. Way before Greece and Rome were, you know, rose to power, the prophet already talked about them. And sometimes it wasn't just one empire. Sometimes it was more than one at the same time. The kings of Mesopotamia and the, and the kings of Egypt were fighting back and forth. And this is why on their conquest journeys, they would destroy the land of Israel back and forth. In Israel, we have cities that have been destroyed 25, 30 times. We found 30 layers. Why? Because when the Egyptians were on the way to Mesopotamia, they destroyed the land. When these were on the way to Egypt, they destroyed the land. And then back and forth. You would think that somebody will just stop building there and move somewhere else. <laughs> but the, all the cities in those days were built on roads. On, on some trade routes. So you see the map of Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia means between the rivers. Which rivers? The Tigris and the Euphrates. Egypt was right on the river. Which river? The Nile. Without water, it could not exist. 
And we know that throughout the scriptures, empires engaged with the people of Israel in ways that are very intriguing. We know that Joseph and Daniel and even Nehemiah were very close to the empire leaders of their time. Joseph in Egypt, we know in Genesis 41, so the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? And Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning as wise and wise as you. You shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regards to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. And he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had, he, and he had him ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried out before him, Bow the knee! So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Sofnat Pa'anach, and he gave his, him as a wife, Asenat, and the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. What about Daniel? The king Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly, your God is the God of gods, the kings, and the re a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts. And he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also Daniel petitioned the king and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Hmm. What about Nehemiah? It's not a knee height, I mean, it's, it's a different, now watch this. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, and I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became uh, uh, dreadfully afraid, and I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lie waste and its gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heavens and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah and to the city of my father's tomb that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will, you be, will your journey be? <laughs> and, when, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me. And I set him a time. He couldn't be away from him. I said, okay, you can go do whatever you want, but be back. Me and my wife, we need you. <laughs> the prophet Daniel was given the most comprehensive picture of the future empires and their role in God's plan. Daniel's story is the times of the Gentiles. Without, listen, if you remember, it was the sinful nature of Israel that caused God to remove earthly kingdom from the kings of Israel to Nebuchadnezzar and on. We all know that. And Daniel, we all will, by the way, just so you know, I'm in charge of the content, not of the color scheme of this uh, presentation. <laughs> Because I look at it, and I... <laughs> and so Daniel chapter two, three. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, 
or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. Look, Daniel is the one who saw all of that. And in that day, these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to, uh, to uh, other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. He spoke of all the kingdoms in the past, all the kingdoms in the future. But then he spoke of a very, very unique kingdom. Take a look at this uh, uh, picture. And you can clearly see all the different um, uh, parts of that image that Daniel interpreted the dream of, of the king. And look at the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, the kingdom of ancient Greece, ancient Rome, the newly restored Roman Empire, and of course the kingdom of God. When Jesus will come back, he will shatter all of earthly kingdoms and we will establish the millennial kingdom. And that is, of course, the crushing rock. He is the rock. Amen? The role of world empire is crucial when it comes to the times of the Gentile. Pastor Gary refers to the time of the Gentiles. And uh, tomorrow's message, if you're not going to be here, you may want to be here. Uh, because tomorrow's message is um, the mystery of the blindness. It's from Romans chapter 11. And we're going to try and ask ourselves, why was there a mystery in blinding Israel? And what does that have to do with Gentiles? Because you're all Gentiles. Look at you. <laughs> and it has to do with you. I mean, his family name starts with Ham. Look. I told you, I could go on and on. Look, when I come to America, I start with a ceremony just to cover the rest of the time that I'm here. I see bacon, what I do, I, I dip my fingers in water, I sprinkle on it, and I say, you are a chicken, you're a chicken, you're a chicken. And for the rest of my stay, the bacon is chicken. So, I'm not afraid of ham anymore. In fact, I'm not even sure why you have so many names for a pig. I mean, ham, bacon, uh, what else? You have pork, what? Yes, I mean, come on, it's a pig and it's okay. Nobody's perfect. So watch this. Revelation 11 says, but leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it has been given to the Gentiles and they will tread the, the holy city under foot for how long? Look, we're not going to be here, but there will be a Gentile kingdom that will rule over Jerusalem and it will be for a specific time, for a, re for a season and for a reason. According to Sir John Bagot Glove, a British author and a soldier, empires follow a re recurring cycle from birth to destruction. Past empires have gone through seven, very interesting, seven stages. Are you ready? First, the age of pioneers, the outburst. Then the age of conquests. You first come, then you start conquering. Then the age of commerce. Then the age of affluence. That's an economic game. Then comes the age of intellect. Then the age of decadence, which is the degeneration. And then comes the age of decline, and collapse. All the empires in the past, in the history of the world, went through all these seven stages. And just because of time, and also I don't want to mess you up with all the horrific descriptions of the different emperors and kings and what they did, I'll just say all of them went through all of these seven. And there were quite a few empires even in recent history, just so you know. There was the British Empire, the Ottoman Empire, 
There was the uh, Soviet Empire. What about past distant history? We had the Persian, Greek, Roman, and we also know that over the last 30 years, there was only one superpower in this world. Can you name that country? America. The United States of America was the sole superpower of the last 30 years. And although the 20th century saw the collapse of seven great empires, Mandarin China, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Ottoman Turkey, Japan, the British Empire, and twice over in the case of Tsarist and Soviet Russia. Since the events of September 11, 2001, the 21st century seems like to threaten the sole remaining superpower, the United States, with nemesis. I was there September 11. In fact, I was on those towers the night before. In fact, I asked my host, what's going to happen if something's going to hit those towers? Because I already knew that they tried eight years earlier to bring them down from underneath. And I knew that you have great enemies. You thought you helped them in Afghanistan in the 1980s. You thought they liked you. The German philosopher Hegel says, what experience and history teach us is this, that people and governments never have learned anything from history or acted on principles uh, deduced from it, exactly. Eric Snow wrote in his book, The Life Cycles of Empires. The growth of wealth and comfort clearly can undermine the value of, a, of character, such as self-sacrifice and discipline, that led to a given empire's creation. Then the empire, so affected by moral decline, grows weaker and more vulnerable to destruction by forces arising inside or outside of it. Not surprisingly, God in the Bible especially warned the ancient Israelites against departing from worshiping him once they became materially satisfied after entering the promised land. He understood this human tendency. And you can read that in Deuteronomy. He warned them. So there are several indications for a decline of an empire. And write that down because it's important, because this may explain to you what's going to happen, what is happening before your very eyes. The first one, increased sexual immorality. And you're probably saying, yeah, yeah, but that's, that, that happened in the Greek Empire, in the Roman Empire. It, it's not something that is only related to nowadays. Second one is undermining the family structure. Third, uncontrollable immigration. Listen, fourth one is reckless living, and the last one, lack of personal responsibility. Make no mistake, I'm not against uh, immigration. I think that when you do it the right way, the legal way, this is what this country is all about to begin with. But when it's uncontrolled, uncontrolled way, and when, when it's done on purpose for a a reason that is not exactly the, the well-being of these people, then it is the beginning of the end. Regarding increased sexual immorality, we see that even the White House became colorful not long ago. We know that uh, half of U.S. Christians even say that casual sex between consenting adults is something or is sometimes or always acceptable. America's sexual transmitted diseases rate at record high again. We see Americans' acceptance of sexual immorality growing a Gallup poll finding. And I need to tell you what Hollywood is promoting, what television and Netflix uh, are all promoting, and they're not just promoting, they're celebrating it to the point that if you're not part of it, you're out of that industry. 
Not to mention the undermining of family structure. U.S. marriage rate hit new recorded lo uh, low. I mean, less and less and less people see the, the need to, to even get married. All right? And it's not because of the mother-in-law. <laughs> because if, <laughs> even if you're not married to her, you're stuck with a mother-in-law. <laughs> you know the story about the two brides that were on a tour. There was a tour of one bus of mother-in-laws and one bus with the brides. And they were traveling and the bus of mother-in-laws fell off the cliff. Everybody kaput. And the busload of brides, yay, they started dancing and singing. There's only two of them that are sobbing in tears in the back. And everybody's saying, why are you, why are you so sad? Why are you so, uh, you know, crying and all that? And they said, oh, our mother-in-laws did not come on this tour. Israelis, they have two places they love to take their mother-in-laws for picnics. One is the sinkholes by the Dead Sea, and the other one is the minefields on the Golan Heights. Let's get back to our <laughs> uncontrollable immigration. Do I need to tell you what's going on in America right now? You know exactly what's going on. It is horrendous. And I'm telling you, somebody is making sure that somebody is going to win elections again with votes that are now being manufactured. What about reckless living? U.S. national debt expected to approach 89 trillion by 2029. You have to understand, by the end of this year, the national debt of America will not be even possible to cover at any given time in, in your life, or your children's life, or your grandchildren's life. This is the point, the tipping point, where a nation is on the free fall. Drug overdoses kill a record number of Americans in 2020, jumping by nearly 30%. How much should we worry today about the rising federal debt, drugs? I mean, people live recklessly. Very, very sad. Dennis Prager said about lack of personal responsibility, along with this individualism came individual responsibility. Just as I am rewarded for my good behavior, I am accountable for my bad behavior. This belief was a result of individualism just des described and of the Judeo-Christian ethic that also animated the founders of this country. Essential to Judaism and Christianity is the notion that you are accountable for your behavior to God. Ultimately, this has been under attack. Galatians 6 verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Now I want to take you back in history. Just as the fall of the British Empire was connected to Israel, the rise of America to a superpower status was connected to Israel. Just so you know. From the Balfour Declaration to the British White Papers, we see how the British Empire made it to its peak and then was on a free fall. The Balfour Declaration in 1917, November, is the ground for the establishment of the State of Israel, if you remember. Lord Balfour promised that Israel, what they call then Palestine, is the homeland of the Jewish people. And that the British Empire and, 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 the, and the, the Queen at the time, they see Her Majesty, his, no, His Majesty at the time was the King Edward, government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. It's amazing. But then the British smells the smell of oil, and they saw that they get nothing but headache from the Jews, but lots of money they can get from the Arabs. They flipped, and between 1922 to 1939, they released a series of what we call white papers. White papers were actually 
official reports by the British government commission and they were usually issued following government investigative commission and there was one in 1922, 1930, 1939, but all of them were following riots that were done by the Arabs and all of them eventually punished the Jews to the point that they limited immigration and because of those white papers, many Jews could not escape Nazi Germany at the time. And that was the end of the British Empire. That's it. And that is the time America started rising to its peak from the recognition of the state of Israel by Harry Truman, if you remember, unfortunately all the way to the push for a Palestinian state by your current president and 44th and those before that. Do you know that it was in 1947 when President Harry Truman was not seeing eye to eye with his powerful Secretary of State George Marshall? There was mock talk about what would happen with Israel when the British mandate ended in May 48. Turning control of the Holy Land to the Jews was anathema to the US State Department, which means it, it is a curse, it can never happen. And look what it happened. In November 1947, the State Department proposed slashing the Negev Desert from the Palestinian mandate, removing nearly half of Israel's future territory the move was only prevented by Truman's last minute intervention. Then on March 19, 1948, Warren Austin, US representative to the UN, proposed a temporary trusteeship for Palestine instead of autonomy. Truman was livid with a stripped pants boy, as he called the State Department bureaucrats, but stopped short of disavowing the trusteeship uh, proposal because of the power of George Marshall. Secretary of State Marshall declared if Truman were to recognize Israel's statehood, the great dignity of the office of president would be seriously diminished. And if in the November elections I were to vote, I would vote against the president. Well, guess what? The Zionists refused the trusteeship and would not be delayed no longer, and when the mandate ended on May 15, 1948, Israel immediately declared statehood, confident that the president would not dare recognize the new country. Marshall and the State Department were floored when at 6.11 p.m., President Harry Truman's White House spokesman announced the president's de facto recognition of the state of Israel, while those in the State Department were livid they had no option but to accept it. So you think Harry Truman had a good life, easy life? Look, this is the paper. He did not even know what the name of the state is going to be. He, was, uh, it, 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 he originally said it was the Jewish state, and then he crossed it after he heard Ben-Gurion's speech, and he said the state of Israel historical paper, but behind it there was so much battle. The State Department up until today cannot stand the establishment of the State of Israel. And therefore since 1947 and on there's a push for a Palestinian state and then it became in a national agreement in 1977 with Jimmy Carter in 1991, George um, Walker Bush, the father, then Slick Willie in 2001, George Bush, the son in 2002, um, uh, Hussein in 2009 and 2011, and even uh, um, Sleepy Joe in 2021. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, listen, all of this, and yet there is no Palestinian state. Why? They poured billions, and there's nothing. Because you cannot invent something that never existed. From 2016 to 2020, there was an accident that happened. It's called Donald J. Trump. Hey, this is not a political rally here. 
I'm not a Republican, although as an Israeli I could easily vote. Anyone can vote here. But you can clearly see that the 45th president, he got it all right and he exposed the lie. And therefore, in his time, four peace agreements in the Middle East, and therefore, in his time, he literally crushed the lie of the Palestinian thing. Look, look at this map of his, uh, of his peace plan. He says, look, this is what we require from the Palestinian. If they want a state, we'll give them a state. We just require from them a few things. One, recognition of Israel as a Jewish state in its new borders, giving up demands of Palestinian capital in Jerusalem's old city, demilitarizing Gaza, disarming Hamas, giving up right of return, and halt all payments to terrorist families. That's it. <laughs> all of this, if you do that, you get a state. Yay! And they read all of that, and they're like, hmm. But we are to obey to the Palestinian terrorists. Uh, we are to, uh, we have Hamas. They have to have weapons or else what uh, Hamas will do. And uh, look, he exposed them. He said, you can have a state, but you don't want a state. Because what you want is Israel, not Gaza. And so, so he opened the door to all the rest of the Arab states to come and have peace with Israel. Genius. I don't know how to imitate him. Mike, you know how to. <laughs> but I do know one thing. The, the, um, the whole peace plan, um, the deal of the century, was never meant for the Palestinians to have a state. It was meant for the Palestinians to admit what they really want. Look, from 1981, you began your affair with Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. You sent the CIA to help the Mujahideen with Stinger missiles. And then, in 2001, you know what happened. And then, you stay there for 20 years until 2021. You were attacked. You went to Afghanistan. You stayed there. And you had a horrific, disastrous pull, pulling out of Afghanistan. And, and you have to understand that whether America is strong or not, it's not the question. You have the strongest military on planet Earth. Do you know that? You have great military, amazing weapon, great commanders, great soldiers. But the world perceives you as weak. It's not if you are strong or not. It's how you are being perceived. And what happened in Afghanistan caused at least the mice in the Middle East to come out of their holes. All of them. Suddenly, China is flexing its muscles. North Korea flexing its muscles. Suddenly, Russia is flexing its muscles. Suddenly, we see Iran. Iran is a few weeks away from nuclear capability. That's it. America's status in the eyes of the world is no longer as of a superpower. Saudi Arabia is shopping right now for someone else to lean on. Is the fall of America from a superpower status predicted in the Bible? <laughs> well, America is not even in the Bible. However, directly it's not, indirectly, Absolutely. As always, it's related to Israel. You need to understand in Ezekiel 38, 
Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tuval. I will turn you around and hook, put a hook into your jaws and lead you out with your army, horses, horsemen, and all splendidly clothed, great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handing swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, and all of them with the shield of Helen, Gomer, and all of its troops, the house of Togarma, with far north and all its troops, many people are with you. This is the description of a coalition that is coming from the north to attack Israel, led by Russia, with Iran, with Turkey, with um, uh, um, Sudan and Libya. And it says, Sheba, Didan, the merchants of our Tarshish, and all the young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? So we see, first of all, America is not mentioned, but we see that there is a a part very radical that will come to take plunder, to steal, and a part that is in a way friendly with Israel that will criticize all of that. But we know one thing, you read Ezekiel and you don't find any nation that is coming to help Israel. Because America is no longer there to help Israel. Make no mistake, even Israel will not help Israel. Not a single verse talks about the greatness of the Israeli military or the greatness of the Israeli commanders or the Israeli government. Trust me, we have a government of change right now. Clowns. I'm lamenting, just like you lament since January. I'm ashamed at what I see. We are also being perceived weak. However, unlike you, we are mentioned in the Bible. Daniel gives us a clue. He says, after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut up, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Then, and the end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. The same empire that is being described as the empire that will destroy the temple and will bring about the death of the Messiah in Jerusalem is now being described in the last week of the 70 weeks, the last seven years. It's not a different one when it comes to um, uh, some ge ge geographical location. This is, he's not even saying, and then somewhere else, someone else. No. The, and this is why we looked earlier and we saw there was the old ancient Roman Empire and there is going to be the revived Roman Empire. But it has to be that area. Daniel speaks as if it's from the exact same place. And for an empire in Western Europe to produce the Antichrist, there has to be a decline or an empire that is right now the superpower in this world. Bible prophecy has nothing to say about nations as such in their relations to one another. You won't find a verse, an America signed peace with Mexico and Canada is crazy in voting for um, Trudeau once again. Um, and Australia is completely out of their mind. You don't, you don't, it's not there. And if he mentions all those empires, it's only in regards to? Exactly. Bible prophecy has nothing to say about nations and such their relation to one another, but only in their relation to Israel, the people, and the land. And it makes sense. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8 and 9. When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. And may I even add the key to all prophecy is the Jew. If the Jewish nation had not forsaken God and neglected the Sabbaths, there would, have been, there would have been no times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles began when God transferred earthly 
rule from the kings of Israel to Gentile King Nebuchadnezzar, and it, it, they will continue until Israel again become the head of all nations, which will be when? In the millennial kingdom. You got that one right. Every nation during the millennial kingdom will have to go to Jerusalem every year to worship the King of Kings in Jerusalem. Every nation. Pastor Chucks talked about, about uh, a, a shop by the Dead Sea for baits and all of that. Invest in hotels and, and, and airplanes flying to Jerusalem. Invest in a new airport in Jerusalem. Air Messiah, Messiah Airlines, Yeshua Airways. You don't <laughs> listen. It's not that they will, they must. Does God ever withhold judgment on empire? Of course not. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men from the place of his dwelling. He looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Remember Jonah, we talked about it today. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah and second say, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. We know exactly which message. We know exactly what happened. We heard this morning. We cannot forget our mission away from home. And we are away from, where is our home? We're now away from home on a mission. All of you, the Bible says our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our what? Look at yourself. Look at yourself now and say, lowly body. <laughs> he will transform our lowly body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Second Corinthians. Look, you may be future governors, because we all govern, we will govern with him, remember? We'll rule with him. Future governors. You don't even have to pay for any campaign. But watch this. Listen. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, now then we are what? Ambassador. You're already an ambassador. You can already have a card. Ambassador. Yes, I am an ambassador. You see? I like it. I think we made those. Thank you. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And I will conclude with this, folks. You're all Americans, at least most of you here. I'm not, <laughs> so. The empire is declining. But I want to remind you, we belong to a different kingdom. Listen to this. Therefore, in Hebrews 12, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. We have a kingdom that cannot be destroyed. Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus said. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. It's, like, it's very Jewish to say that. My Father's house, many mansions. I would have told you if there's not so. Hello. I go to prepare a place for you. Where is Jesus now? What is he doing right now? 
And then, what's the point of preparing a place for us and nobody is going to be there? I don't understand those post trade groups. You go up, you see your manager, boom, you go down again. <laughs> he worked on it for 2,000 years and we just walked. Look, if I go to, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, hello, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. He basically said, you are going to change address. <laughs> it is not, you know how many Christians, we are going to prepare this earth for him to come back. No. <laughs> he is preparing heaven for us to go up. You understand? So, we go back to the two disciples on their way to Emmaus. They were sad, they were angry, they were embarrassed. We invested three years in this guy. We didn't even make good money. We left our boats and our fish and everything. We thought he is going to replace this evil Roman Empire and he is dead. And they are telling that to Jesus, who is alive and walking right next to them. <laughs> and then Jesus says to his disciples, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe that which the prophets have said. Jesus said, prophecy explains why these things have to happen. And prophecy also explains that this is not the end. Ought not the Messiah to have suffered first? Ought not for America to decline in order for the rise of the empire that will give birth to the Antichrist? Ought not for believers to see the end and be encouraged that God is on the move? And I want to remind you what the disciples did that night. Jesus disappeared, if you remember, after they realized it's him. And that night, they didn't even wait for the morning. That night, they turned around and <laughs> walked back to Jerusalem. If the walk to Emmaus was a walk of shame, the walk to Jerusalem back was the walk of hope and victory. The Messiah is alive. We know why he had to suffer. And I want all of us this afternoon to remember that although things look very grim and things look very bad and things look, and may, they might even be even worse. In fact, they will be worse. We have citizenship elsewhere. Father, we thank you. We thank you that as we watch the decline of an empire, we know that we belong to a, a kingdom that is imperishable. We thank you, Father, that we are future rulers and we are already ambassadors. And we are here to implore people to be reconciled to you. We thank you that Jesus for the last 2,000 years has been working on mansions for us. We thank you for your plan to come back and receive us unto yourself. So where you are, we will also be. And until then, as we heard earlier today, we need to occupy. Until then, we need to do the Father's business. And until then, we are not to fight any battles that are not for us, but we are here to make disciples, to spread the gospel, to give the hope of salvation to the people that are still lost, and to be found faithful upon your return to take us. Thank you and we bless you in the name that is above all names, in the name of the Holy One of Israel, the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Emmanuel, the Prince of Peace, Sal Shalom, in the name of Yeshua, who is our salvation, Jesus, we pray.
And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Well, did you learn anything from that tonight? Does that put America in perspective in terms of prophecy? I mean, it, it took a while to get there, but absolutely, you, you understand. And I think one of the most important thing is that we don't build a false hope. Uh, and by that, I mean that we're going to be able to restore our nation back to the way it used to be, as if we are going to alter uh, the prophesied, already settled in heaven, events that are, are yet to take place on a worldwide basis. So that's, that's very critical. But at the same time, he summarized everything very well there at the end. Occupy until I come. We have a citizenship that is in heaven. So what do we do with that citizenship is we live it out here on this earth. We have full responsibility of what it is to maintain uh, preaching the gospel and uh, worship services, Christian education. We have a land whereby uh, we have full and complete liberty to be able to bring the next generation up in the knowledge of God, only here in the America. And so it is our duty to defend those rights even if we might say to the very bitter end. And there are tangible ways in which we do that. And that is, for example, we have the school, we have this church, we have a missionary outreach, we are still a prosperous nation. We take full advantage of all of those blessings and we invest in them heavily. Not so that we're going to save the nation. That's just one of the things that I picked up from all that. We're not going to save America. But in the meanwhile, we have a lot of saving to do of individual souls and people and preparing Christians and non-believers to be able to have and enjoy that same citizenship that we as Christians have right now. So we, we stay true to the text. We stay true to our mission calling. We stay true to everything that involves being a patriot because all of those things help elongate the time. You notice he never mentioned when it's going to happen. In the end, what really uh, reveals the, the, uh, where America ends is the fact that the revived Roman Empire is the only empire standing, so that everybody else virtually is dismantled and disappeared, including us. But until that time comes, as Jesus said, occupy, hold fast, maintain until I come. So, uh, any comments or questions that, you, that you'd like to share with us tonight? Did you, did you learn something from it, Jamie? So if that's not set in stone for us believers, we have a job to be evangelists, to be ambassadors for Christ, because it could be 33% of 500 million. It could be 33% of 10,000. Yeah. So that's up to us as Christians to spread the word of God, to plant those seeds, to teach people what it is to know the hope of Jesus Christ. And that percentage might not be as, you know, doom and gloom as what Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. We do. We have the ability to, to impact a lot of what is going to happen in the tribulation by bringing people to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, leaving fewer people on the earth during that horrible seven and a half years. So uh, it's, it was, I thought it was an extremely informative, uh, instructional way of putting uh, America as a nation, in the context of global events, prophetic events, leading up to uh, the time when Jesus Christ returns 
And it's interesting how everything surrounds Israel. It is just so fascinating. Just one more side thought. Uh, he mentioned Harry Truman, uh, which when you think back, most of the time when people talk about Harry Truman, especially my parents and grandparents, that was not actually a good thing back then. But there was another president, uh, uh, and I, I'll have to pull out the DVD that brings this out, but Richard Nixon also made an exclusive administrative national decision on behalf of Israel in their favor. Uh huh. Yeah. He, oh, yes. It was during a time when they were in the war that he invested millions of dollars, military support, helping Israel. And I think it was the uh, the Six Day War. It was, may have been sometime. It was during the Nixon administration. But at any rate, just to bring you up to date, there was another president that had um, offered an immense amount of help for Israel in favor of Israel. Yes. What? Can, can you start over? Okay, so Israel became a nation in 1948. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's one of those next generations will, that Jesus talked about also in the New Testament. And that statement with the uh, establishment of Israel as a nation, using that phrase is a misapplication of that phrase to the nation. I think it would be the best way to answer that question. Because what we don't know uh, is how long the generation actually lives. And if that is the case, then we can almost set an approximate date as to when uh, there would be the start of the tribulation period. So that phrase has been a burn, a lot of theologian saddles over the, uh, the course of history trying to determine when Jesus will return. In our day, it was going to be sometime in the 80s. And it's centered around the establishment of Israel as a national state. But that that has soon been dispensed with. It, it just never materialized. So that's just one of those phrases we have to be careful with. The, the, yeah. yeah, his definition is is different. Any other questions? I hope I was able to answer your question. It's the, the way that uh, you presented it. All right, let's close in prayer. Our Father, we are so grateful. Thank you for uh, Pastor Amir the presentation of biblical prophecy, our role as a nation, the decline of uh, the, the superpower that we once were. But, yeah, Lord, uh, help our hearts to be encouraged. As he said, Jesus is preparing a place for us. We have that heavenly citizenship that Paul mentions in Philippians. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We know that we will rule and reign with him. And what we want to do, Lord, is expand the population of that kingdom time by those that we introduce to Jesus Christ, by the children that we educate here at Colonial Christian School. So, Father, continue to be our source of strength, our guide, our wisdom in how we live in this nation today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Thank you for the extra time that you're here tonight. We'll see you next week.